There are two major philosophical quandaries that modern science grapples with. One is the hard problem of consciousness. How does a living subjective experience like you and I emerge from the non-living material world? The other is the weirdness of the subatomic world. Why are the fundamental building blocks of the universe act in weird and probabilistic ways? I'm going to make the argument that the answer to both these problems is not necessarily in the realm of science, but in the realm of philosophy. And in fact, it was discussed with passion nearly 2000 years ago by an ancient Buddhist scholar called Nagarjuna. Not because he wanted to answer these exact questions, but because he was busy solving his own problems. He was working hard to revoke the Hindu influences that had crept inside Buddhist teachings. But before we get into all that, let me set the stage and walk you through the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is a term coined by the Australian philosopher David Chalmers. He distinguished it from the easy problem of consciousness, which was a problem that science was trying to solve. The chemistry of neurons and the way the memory is encoded in the brain, that sort of thing. The hard problem of consciousness, he claimed, was the part that couldn't be explained by the chemical machinery of the brain. The subjective experience, or qualia if you will, that feeling of what it's like to be something rather than something else. That was the hard problem. Now, there are many modern philosophers and scientists who politely disagree with Chalmers. The rebuttal that most philosophers have is that consciousness is merely an illusion. And the easy problem of consciousness, which is to say the machinery of the chemical brain-body system, is enough to explain our living experience. You just have to get past that pesky illusion to notice that there is no hard problem. So, to rephrase the rebuttal to the hard problem of consciousness, it isn't really that hard. We just perceive it as hard because we are living through it. We suffer through life. And that makes us biased to our own proclivities, to our own dispositions. We cannot let go of our own egos and see past the subjective experience because that's what gives us agency. The agency to make decisions, the agency to build a better future for ourselves, the agency to motivate us to do something rather than doing nothing and staying in bed all day. The will to live and thrive is alive in all of us and it's no small task to let go of that. This is actually a very close approximation to the Buddhist philosophy that I was talking about. Buddhism arose as a direct opposition to certain kinds of a hard problem that the ancient Hindus had. They had cornered themselves into thinking that there is an eternal soul that reincarnates with us every time we die. And the Hindus refused to believe in a materialist explanation for consciousness. Instead of believing in an essence that transfers your consciousness to another place after your death. Buddhist philosophy, on the contrary, is all about understanding that consciousness is merely an illusion, albeit a persistent one, and trying to see through the veil of our subjective experience. The final two steps in Buddha's famous Eightfold Path towards enlightenment is about building self-awareness and the right kind of concentration to see past yourself. Instead of explaining the subjective experience with an eternal soul that incarnates and reincarnates into different beings, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, claimed that consciousness can be simply explained as an affinity towards certain dispositions. But after the death of the Buddha, the political powers of ancient India, which included a strong caste system, did not particularly take a liking towards Gautama's teachings. They constantly tried to undermine it by trying to incorporate concepts like reincarnation into the Buddha's teachings. Several hundred years after Gautama's death, a fierce reformist called Nagarjuna emerged in the ranks of the Sangha and tried to put an end to all this pressure coming from Hinduism. He vehemently denied the need for a metaphysical explanation of consciousness. And he famously coined the concept of sunyata, roughly translated to emptiness, to describe life, the universe and everything. Here's where I want to take a breather. Most Western scholars, when they hear the word emptiness, immediately jump to the conclusion that sunyata is a nihilistic philosophy, taking the word at its literal meaning to mean that there is no meaning to life. 
But on the contrary, to understand Sunyata, you have to understand the historical context in which Nagarjuna brought this up. Nagarjuna was not trying to invent something new. In fact, he didn't even consider himself an original philosopher. He was merely acting as the voice of Gautama and replying and giving explanations to those who sought after the truth. And as a response to what is the ultimate substance of consciousness, he replied, there is no ultimate substance. Everything you see is empty. Everything is sunyata. It's as if Nagarjuna was throwing his hands up in the air and screaming, don't you see, nothing is eternal. There is nothing to hold on to. And of course, the Hindu rebuttal to that was, well, if there's nothing to hold on to, there must be no meaning to life. To which Nagarjuna responded by saying that the meaning we see in the world occurs due to interaction. Two inherently empty things can interact with each other and be meaningful to each other. Let me repeat that again because this is important. Two inherently empty things can interact with each other and be meaningful to each other. In other words, meaning arises from emergence. There's a lot more to Nagarjuna's teachings that are a bit more abstract and goes into Buddhist logic. But let's stick to sunyata for this video. Nagarjuna's sunyata has interesting philosophical implications that parallel what modern science has independently arrived at. It is fundamental objects have no meaning, but when they interact, meaning arises from emergence. If you're a scientist working on complexity theory, you might have seen this foreshadowing from a mile away. Because emergence is one way that modern philosophers like to explain consciousness and every other complex thing in the universe. Let me give you a few examples. Waves in the ocean arise from water molecules being pushed and pulled by the tidal forces. We can see the waves, we can touch the waves, we can surf the waves, but in the microscopic scale, waves have no meaning. To the individual water molecules, the concept of a wave does not make sense. But it does make sense to us. Another example is temperature. Our bodies like to be exactly at 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We feel cold or hot if the temperature outside is different than this exact value. But does this temperature really exist? Not really. In the microscopic scale, temperature arises because atoms constantly bounce against each other and have this internal interaction. When you decrease the temperature, the movement of these atoms slow down. From the perspective of an individual atom, temperature has no meaning. But in the scale of human beings, temperature does have a meaning. You can argue that consciousness has this same kind of property. In the realm of individual neurons or individual cells, consciousness has no meaning. In the scale of human beings or any other living thing that has subjective experience, consciousness seems to be an emergent property of the system. The power of emergence doesn't stop at explaining consciousness. We can even extend it to quantum field theory. We know that the Higgs field interacts with the rest of the quantum fields to give mass to subatomic particles. The quark fields interact with each other to give the impression of a strong nuclear force. At every level in the universe, meaning arises from interaction. We humans, with our innate proclivities to object permanence, like to reduce things into point-like particles. We like things to be consistent. What if Instead of focusing on the constant, we focus on what persists through time. The Buddha once said, the only constant in this world is change. And the truth or samma of Buddhist logic is about understanding this change. In other words, although the reality we perceive from our senses tend to focus on objects, the real meaningful things occur in the space of interactions. This is the essence of what Nagarjuna called sunyata. If you look at the world in a reductionist viewpoint, in the lens of fundamental particles or individual objects, you will get lost in levels and levels of abstraction. The deeper you go in search of meaning, you will realize there is no real meaning to the underlying structure of the universe. True, there is something more fundamental at every level. Some might say it's reference frames all the way down. Some say it's turtles all the way down. But instead of looking for fundamental constituents, if instead you look for interactions, you will soon see that there is meaning everywhere in every level of the universe.
There is one last example of sunyata that I would like to leave you with before I end this video. I want you to extend the concept of sunyata to our collective humanity. Alone, as single entities, our existence might seem meaningless. Alone in the darkness, it might seem that the sole meaning of life is the struggle to survive. But in our struggles to survive, we become more than ourselves. We become different things to different people. We become children, we become parents, we become friends, we become teachers and we become students. We become all these things to different peoples at different times in our lives. We become archetypes in the spectrums of gender. We become archetypes in the stories that we tell ourselves. Heroes and anti-heroes, villains and anti-villains. We create meaning from the way we interact with each other. Meaning arises from how we treat each other. And meaning arises from how we collectively define each other. Personal identity is not just personal. It's a collective undertaking that we have with the people we care for and the people that we don't. There is a lot more to say about identity and the politics that facilitate or reject multiple expressions of our humanity, but I'm gonna leave it here for now and let you ponder on that. It's a fraught political subject filled with personal biases, and maybe one day, if I'm brave enough, I'll tackle that in another video to make sure I do it justice. If you're interested in learning more, I've written a science fiction book called Transdimensional Tea that goes through all these facets of sunyata and interaction, from the physical to the psychological to the sociological and eventually cosmological. If you want to explore these ideas a little more, I invite you to read it and in doing so interact with the characters that I've brought to life. The characters that I believe might show a glimpse of what humanity may leave behind for the rest of the galaxy, long after we're gone.